and participants of this panel, which is called Knowledge of War Experience, Academia, Journalism. Uh, war is uh, the realm of uncertainty. Three quarters of the factors in which action in war is based are wrapped in a fog of greater or lesser uncertainty. These were the famous words of uh, Karl von Clausewitz, and he referred to the situation of participants in the conflict. Uh, armies use intelligence to pierce through the fog, but they also use propaganda and disinformation to enhance the fog. The fog of war may be a weapon on its own directed at the enemy, but also at the population behind the front lines and the general public. Censorship repressions against journalists and academics, disinformation, corruption, remain the condition of knowledge production about the war of the last decade, despite recent wars being streamed and broadcast online. In this panel, we'll focus on knowledge production about societies at war, conditioned by inequalities and hierarchies in the context of imperialism, colonialism, and nationalism. How the experience of living in the war zone is reflected in the knowledge and understanding of the war. How to deal with gatekeepers of knowledge from officers to state officials and editors of news agencies. What role does the distance threats, material conditions and fatigue play in access to knowledge? How to cooperate under these conditions? These and other questions we're gonna discuss with our guest speakers whom I feel personally priv privileged to meet, I will briefly introduce them. First, Dr. Dana L. Kurd, uh, who is an assistant professor of political science at the University of Richmond and a senior and a resident fellow at the Arab Center in Washington. Dr. L. Kurd's work focuses on authoritarian regimes in the Arab world state society relations in these countries and the impact of international interventions. Dr. Daria Cimbaluk is an assistant professor at the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Chicago, the US. Her research interests comprise ecology, knowledge production and artistic practices in Ukraine. Dr. Elaf Badadin is an assistant professor of Arab studies at Davidson College, US. Dr. Bader Dean studied translation in the context of the Arab revolutions and the war in Syria. His latest research is in musical practices of former political prisoners in Syria, prisons, uh, those former prisoners who are in exile. And Dr. Johanna Katishova is an assistant professor in journalism and documentary at the University of Amsterdam. Dr. Katishova's research interests include crisis and conflict reporting, media professional safety, emotional labor, and mental well being. Her recent work is centered on journalistic work in the coverage of conflicts in Ukraine, Israel, and Palestine. A bit of housekeeping. Uh, we are going to have 90 minutes, uh, one and a half hour for the discussion, and we're going to uh, hope we're going to cover four questions in, in, a round, in, in rounds. And uh, I got, just, just before starting, I got a great, uh, a great news that we can continue for a bit longer, like uh, for about two hours, or prospectively until uh, until midnight or, or, or later because it's the last panel of this conference but uh, do, nominally let's let's stick to one and a half hour uh, to the audience uh, I would like to announce that we have translation into Ukrainian audience there is interpretation in Ukrainian and you can switch it on in Zoom. And lastly, the last 30 or 20 to 30 minutes is going to be dedicated to Q&A session. So please uh, ask your questions at the Q&A uh, panel or 
uh, yeah, window in Zoom. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's begin. And I would first like to address the question of who framed wars, who frames wars and what assumptions are there in academia and in policy-oriented research that forces us or allows us to categorize wars and combatant civilians? How are these assumptions formed and how can they be challenged? I would invite our speakers to reflect on this based on their, uh, their research. We would just go, go in rounds in alphabetical order. So I would invite uh, Dr. Dana el Kurd first. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, again, um, I already apologized to my co-panelists, but I'm apologizing to everybody that I'm sick, and so I sound a little uh, not great, <laughs> but um, hopefully it's still understandable. Um, so just to give a context of how uh, where I'm coming from when I'm answering this question, I'm a Palestinian living in the United States. Uh, my education is in the American system, and I'm working now in American academia, um, but I also um, engage with the policy policy world, policy making spaces in DC um, and and with civil society actors um, in the Arab world and in the global north. So I kind of, I straddle a lot of different spaces, I would say. So I'm gonna talk about that question of who frames wars and what assumptions there are across those kind of three spaces that I engage with most regularly. So in academia, I'm a political scientist. Um, and so I'm going to be speaking specifically about political science, but political science is so embedded uh, in kind of, you know, power structures um, in a way that maybe some other disciplines um, uh, are not as much. Um, so within political science, there's certain understandings about how war is conducted, depending on who the actor is. Um, so those democracies, quote unquote, aligned with the American kind of order, American international order, I find are studied separately and differently from authoritarian actors uh, also engaging in war. Um, and when their conduct is studied, it's often about their military effectiveness, their military capacity. So that skews, you know, how we understand the impacts of these wars um, and, um, you know, the, the knowledge that is produced about them. So in the case that I know the most, um, given that I, I study Palestine and the Arab world, so uh, for lack of a better term, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Israel as defined as a democracy in like our data sets and things like this, the, the discussion of what Israel's current war, for example, in the last year means, I find is a, a lot more focused on kind of the military effectiveness. There's a lot of like awe about the AI usage and things like this. And the impact on the human population at the receiving end of this war is maybe never acknowledged or only tangentially acknowledged. Palestinian scholars and scholarship um, are also really not integrated into the mainstream of poli sci of the political science discipline. Um, it's a, you know there's a separate space. There's Palestine studies, but there's very little engagement in political science um, with Palestine studies. Of course, there are exceptions, and the, the those are the, you know my friends in academia are the ones that are engaging with this. But the vast majority of the discipline, there's 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 not an integration of Palestinian scholarship, or uh, you know, not even in American academia, not even Palestinian scholars in acad in American academia, let alone Palestinian scholars in Palestinian universities. Um, so that that also is is a huge bias in our knowledge production um, around the conflict generally. In policy spaces, as I said, I engage with policy. I'm a senior non-resident fellow at the Arab Center in Washington. And, um, you know, uh, my take on academics engaging in public or policy discussions is that, like, we do have, like, a responsibility to try to, um, for lack of a better term, translate some of our academic scholarship to broader usage. And so I try to do that, um, whether it's with policymaking circles, as I said, or with civil society organizations, because I also study um, social movements and mobilization. Um, but in the policy spaces that I engage with, so particularly in like the DC circle, um, again, even those that are not like government entities. So like, it's not, you know, I'm not necessarily presenting to the State Department only, you know, uh, even other think tanks and things like that, that are not necessarily government entities, they are deeply embedded 
in uh, um, deeply embedded with power uh, structures and um, have engagements with the government and things like this. Again, the war is framed in the context of American strategic interests. It's not framed um, in the context of the human, human impact and, you know, really. Uh, so either my, my, my experience um, the last year and, and before that is that either Palestinians don't get included in these discussions at all. Um, but if they do, the framing is very specific. The framing is, you know, about America's strategic interests. It's about um, the Israel-Hamas war, especially in the last year. So it's it's uh, a constraining narrative in some ways. And my attempts in engaging in these discussions has always been to try to push the narrative from within those confines. Um, and so I'm invited on the on uh, I'm invited under the framing of uh, under the assumption of American strategic interests, and then I try to, you know, explain my research and explain my takeaways within that context to try to make it relevant to to, to people in the room. But it is a constraining narrative. Um, one example I'll just end with on this question is, um, I you know, when I'm asked, so I just spoke about policy spaces, but also the media is is a similar I think dynamic for me. Um, when I'm asked to engage with media, establishment media that is geared towards these policymakers, so things like foreign affairs or foreign policy, again, the 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 framing is is very constrained. So I was asked to write for foreign policy most recently. The framing was, is the Hamas Israel war? You know, I mean, there are so many assumptions embedded in that kind of framing. Some some scholars. Uh, some scholars don't, you know, refuse to engage uh, um, with that kind of constraining narrative. I have sometimes refused, sometimes haven't, depending on if I feel like I can push the narrative from from within that framing. But again, just an example of how much it constrains, you know, what were what is even talked about um, in in those discussions. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that for for this question, and I'll have more to say in the next ones. Thank you very much, and especially thank you for excellent timekeeping. And I would like to remind that uh, we if, each, each would roughly, if you don't mind, take five minutes for, for an answer, right? So next, uh, I'd invite Dr. Daria Tsimbaluk. Yes, um, thank you so much. Sorry, I also had a bit of confusion, so maybe my answers will be a bit fragmented because um, I'll, I'll improvise a bit today. The, when it comes to the question of frames, and I, I think of frames as always, you know, potentially always carrying violence because they always exclude something. Um, but for me, there is this tension here in terms of the external gaze um, at the place of the war. In my case, it's Ukraine, or the and the internal need to really speak up and and use. Um, the opportunity politically to speak up about what's going on on the ground. And I feel like I'm constantly kind of struggling as a scholar coming from Ukraine um, and working in Ukraine, um, kind of to negotiate between this external gaze, which is also quite often tokenizing, you know, framing you in terms of the, the, the voice from Ukraine, um, and this in my political need to bring up and to use this instrumentally, these opportunities that are given to me to speak, whether as a scholar, or when I write for the media and approach uh, to kind of uh, to kind of raise the issues that I need uh, to raise, and I've been thinking and, and kind of rereading a text by Lesya Kulchinska um, called "Dark Matter of Image," which I really recommend, in which she's talking about um, you know Ukraine being in a spotlight, and and I call it a morbid spotlight um, because it's a kind of privilege to be in a spotlight, which we know is also not afforded to many other places that experience violence. Um, but uh, at the same time, it is a very limiting um, uh, space to be and with, with an expiration date, as we know, in relation to, to war and violence. And so Lesya Kulchinska, uh, and I'll quote for, for her, um, she writes, it is true that Ukraine experiences a rapid rise of attention because of war. In order to convert this attention into victory or at least survival, we need to expose our victimhood to get the protection you need to show and prove that you are endangered, that you are vulnerable. Your victimhood should be clearly visible, accessible, understandable, and accountable. It should be exposed, end quote. And so 
the, the knowledge, the tech share, because the knowledge that we are aware of, of, of the gaze that is directed to us, and the only way we can do is kind of um, curate the spectacle, right, to be conscious of the spectacle. And that is, I think, the position that I often find myself in. Um, and I would be very interested to hear from colleagues as well of how they experience and negotiate the spaces um, of, of, uh, of being looked at and, and um, having certain expectations of, uh, of, of how we speak. And if I think about my own trajectory in academia and knowledge, it's also quite interesting. Um, so I came to academia in 2015 from a participatory art project in which I worked with people displaced from Donetsk and Mohansk Oblast. Um, and it was really um, kind of a very low budget uh, project that in, engaged interventions public space in Kyiv and was not meant to be made in any way in relation to academia. And I came uh, with a degree for my BA in German and uh, Italian in modern languages and studio art. And when I started studying for masters, I was convinced I'm going to do uh, kind of comparative literature in German and Italian. Um, and in my first meeting for my master's, I was allocated a supervisor in the Russian department, to which I responded very negatively. I, I felt that there was some kind of violence directed at me just because I'm coming from the space of um, Eastern Europe, that I, I'm supposed to work on Eastern Europe, where I had like, never had any training or interest really to be looking at Eastern Europe at that point. Um, and then um, I met my supervisor, and I also went to that meeting kind of with the, with the thinking that... Um, studying comparative literature or cultural studies as only studying great white men. And then I was, uh, was for me a discovery that I could work actually in the fact the art projects that I was working on with displaced people at that moment, um, I had no kind of framework for, for thinking that that could be relevant in terms of knowledge production. But looking back at it, I also think of that moment of being allocated uh, to the Russian department and kind of the moment I found myself in the Slavic studies is also the moment of, I guess, the field recognizing this focus on the war and displacement as, as a potential resource, right? As a kind of, as interest in, um, in, in framing it productively. And that's how I ended up kind of uh, moving into this field. And now I find myself in the position of also being in the Slavic department and studying Ukraine. And my work is fully focused on the war since 2015, just finished writing a book about the war. And I constantly think, and of course, for me, it's in a kind of, I turned fully in, in terms of in my own, I guess, understanding from that resistance of being there in a way of embracing it politically and thinking, okay, I'm going to instrumentalize it and use it to speak up. Um, but I'm still kind of conscious and thinking a lot in terms of, in a way, um, what, what I call there's a kind of condition of ontological sadness in which this frames position us and, and at the same time privilege in my case of actually studying and engaging with, with it and being in safety. Um, but um, the, the certain trajectories and directions of flow of knowledge, um, how they're conditioned, um, also conditioned by violence itself um, and my own participation um, and, and space of complicity and resistance within these frames. And I'll maybe stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Uh, yeah, we see a very interesting contrast emerging here, uh, where, uh, whereas Dana talked about Palestinians being uh, ignored, being uh, out of focus uh, at best. Uh, Daria stressed that Ukrainians are in the focus, in the morbid spotlight. Uh, I wonder whether we uh, will uh, uphold this, this line further. But in any case, I would uh, invite uh, Dr. Uh, Badereddin. Hello, everyone. Actually, thank you so much for the invite. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Uh, maybe like uh, to follow up actually for all of the uh, for Daria and Dana and what they have like mentioned about the knowledge production. I would say first of all, I would try like show my positionality. I mean, and and my position also at the same time about like where I am uh, uh, in the research itself. Actually, I work or I worked like in this uh, about the Syrian revolution in two thousand eleven. And uh, this like started like by like witnessing phase of it in 2011 between Damascus and Beirut. And part of my job at the, at the revolution at that time was like working for Time magazine, interpreting for journalists who were coming, who were like there at that, at that time. And what really like noticed all the time is about like 
uh, coming all of the journalists who are like part of the knowledge production for the West itself, like coming with already uh, uh, framed terms and also like framed ideas about the conflict in Syria before like writing their articles and producing it, the, the, the knowledge itself, like in the West or like uh, uh, between the peripheries and the center itself. So trying like to think about um, 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 about like who is framing the wars, who is framing the knowledge about the war. Maybe as the 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 whole meeting like is about like the center and the per periphery. I mean, I can say like simply yes, it's the center who's doing this at the end. But also at the same time, moving to academia itself and also following up of what Dana like said also about the knowledge production and the language itself. Who is taking the scholarships that are like produced by the Arab native language itself and how it is presented in the books and in the knowledge itself in academia, we can see it like mostly absent. Uh, maybe kind of, I can like mention like one of the examples that I worked about, uh, I'm talking here about peripheries all the time, by the way, like it's like not the same as, not all peripheries are the same peripheries. I mean, talking about Syria as a periphery, it's not like the same talking about Egypt as a periphery. Uh, um, um, but I mean, both of them are peripheries. I mean, definitely we're talking about this. So, and there are a lot of aspects also like to know how those conflicts were framed in English, for example. Uh, so like talking about the example of Syria, like after 2011, all of the media outlets were kicked out of the country. So, which obliged all of the discourse, I mean, outside of Syria to be dependent on the, what is called the citizen journalists, I mean, which has its own pros and cons. While talking about another periphery like Egypt, I mean, uh, we can see that the public space there, if we can call it a space, I mean, itself was like very open for all of the agents there to cover and see what's happening in, in Tahrir, in the Midan, to the extent that there was like one course about the language of the Egyptian revolution at the time, at the AUC, at the time of the revolution in Egypt. However, I mean, going to Europe, uh, uh, in the past 10 years and studying like Syria and the knowledge produced about Syria. Uh, and according to some statistics like I've made, uh, uh, like about the knowledge production itself, uh, we can see that Syria was labeled from the start as conflict, uh, uh, turmoil, clashes, unrest, but not a revolution, contrary to what happened in Egypt and Tunisia. Until like we reached like the war, the war itself, I mean, in, in 2013, 14, 15 by the Russian intervention and then so far and so on. Um, um, just uh, trying to scrutinizing or like studying all of the books that were like written in academia. I mean, we can see that most of those books are depending on the English language production, like rather than, you know, what was produced in, 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 in Arabic itself. And maybe I would like to talk more about it, like in the coming, coming uh, um, um, parts of this discussion about how the knowledge production itself is produced and who's deciding what to be translated. But also at the same time, I mean, if the peripheral voices are be able like to reach the, the, the center itself and which ways they are like seen or perceived. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Johanna Katishova, please. Hello, everyone. Thanks a lot for having me. And I'm really, um, really happy to meet all of you and to be able to engage in this exchange. Um, it's great. And I'm going to probably um, tie together a few of the topics that you've spoken about because uh, I come from media studies, um, specifically journalism studies. and. Recently, I uh, finalized a project about uh, the transnational collaboration between foreign reporters and local producers and local fixers in Ukraine and Palestine. And for this, I spoke to um, Palestinian and Ukrainian uh, media professionals, um, as well as foreign reporters who cover the wars um, on the ground. Um, and I think what we see um, is that the media um, reproduces or repeats some of the patterns that you've also um, spoken about. Um, so there, there are also some similarities between how media frame the war and how media research frames the war, or media and academia. Uh, and when if you if you look at the media, if you focus on the media, uh, I think when you look at the globally powerful media organizations, um, the actors who frame wars and who speak about wars and we're probably 
going to talk about it in the next um, um, in the next round as well. But these people who often talk about wars are people who who are not at home um, in um, in the areas that they cover. Uh, they belong to a, a more privileged um, part of the world, and the, this assumption that you should be an outsider um, to the context that you cover as a journalist has very very strong roots, very deep roots. Um, there has even been, been this habit that journalists rotate on uh, on foreign reporting assignments, so that they don't. Uh, that they don't lose the distance, that they don't um, they, 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 they don't become too close um, uh, to the context that they are covering. And I think that these roots uh, are firmly grounded in a system of epistemic hierarchy that we see in the, the foreign reporting and in coverage of wars, where detachment, rationality, uh, objectivity and neutrality are set against um, engagement, emotionality, subjectivity, and moral clarity. Uh, so the first position where you're objective and detached um, and rational is privileged. Uh, but by privileging this, um, this position um, that is distantiated, um, that keeps its distance, I think that we are losing uh, a part of the knowledge. Um, that's, that's the way how, how knowledge about wars is uh, is produced and how wars are framed is um, is missing something and it's missing and it's losing an incredibly rich resource and that is the embodied knowledge of people who are actually at home um, in areas um, that that the media are covering uh, and this uh, their embodied knowledge um, that expresses itself as emotions as emotional engagement um, as moral feelings and so on. And this embedded knowledge is grounded in uh, in the local experience. And I think this is something that um, media as well as uh, academia very often misses. You talk about how um, yeah, um, knowledge about Palestine, Palestine is confined to Palestinian studies. I think, um, yeah, with Ukraine, you, you can see that, uh, yeah, you, Daria, talked about how, how knowledge about Ukraine was kind of hidden or um, dissolved in in uh, departments of Slavic studies, or or even produced as a part of Russian studies. Um, so, I think we're losing we're losing an incredibly rich part of what we could know about context. And this is similar to media research, where I've heard um, Ukrainian academics. Um, um, experiences about um, their knowledge being dismissed because they are considered too local, too biased, too emotional. Um, and from what I what I've heard um, um, about the Palestinian journalists and and um, yeah Ukrainian journalists' experiences is the same. And in in journalism, your knowledge is kind of um, your localized knowledge is dismissed because you're supposed to be your beliefs to be too biased or too emotional, too local. Um, then there is there is this problem that um, academic institutions, at least in my area, um, but it's a whole different topic. Maybe we should <laughs> I shouldn't even open this box. But academic institutions don't allow people to go to places um, because of security reasons, and I think this creates another gap of uh, where where the knowledge that is produced is actually like like very literally colonial because we have the knowledge and the local people have the culture um, and we can't go there and uh, we need to outsource um, data gathering and then the academic institutions are extremely happy to publish papers uh, or to 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 get the credits for for papers published based on the the, the knowledge that is outsourced um yeah and yeah so um yeah the result of this this hierarchy, uh, I think, is that there is just not um, not enough contextual knowledge, and there is a lot of academic garbage being produced. Um, sadly, um, so the the lack of uh, attention paid to context, I think, is crucial uh, to mention, um, and I think because. Uh, I, if, if I'm not mistaken, part of the question was about challenging these um, these assumptions or these um, 
these hierarchies. And I think we should really uh, try to revise um, and dismantle the epistemic hierarchies and try to revise the, the notion of knowledge, uh, what knowledge is in academia and in the media, uh, and really pay attention to the context. Uh, I, I'll probably stop here because I'll, I guess I'll need, uh, we'll, need, we'll get to the, um, to the other topics and to some of the topics yeah. in the next. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Don't, yeah, the, don't, don't be too strict about the, the, the questions because you will obviously have an occasion to raise your, your, your issues in, in late, later on. So, yeah, and it was actually an excellent transition to the second question, which is about the the voices uh, whose voices and experiences are prioritized in academia and media discourses and wars and uh, what are the criteria criteria of selection uh, yeah and now I, I, yeah basically you just continue uh, talking about your cases and it's uh, it's it's a good transition thank you yeah we'll just go in rounds or if you want if someone wants to start do you mind if i start <laughs> I just already unmuted myself. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of like the second question about like who speaks and whose voices and experiences are prioritized, we've already really touched on upon that a lot. Um, but I thought I could also bring up um a specific example that uh demonstrates this more fully. Um, both related to the last year uh, uh of what's happening in Gaza, but also beyond that, you know, generally how um how academic and media discourses uh, metabolize or don't different kinds of information. So specifically in the last year, especially since like I'd say January, there's been a lot of discussion about like the day after in Gaza and a lot of plans put forward about what the day after in Gaza would look like. These plans are all, you know, contingent on this idea that the Israelis are interested in a day after in Gaza. Um, so the fact that there is a lot of a lot of effort to put together these day after plans kind of speaks to how much people assume that they can't do anything about the current crisis they have to wait until the day after to start a, a discussion about anything um but those day after discussions very rarely again or if at all um include palestinian input um it's um it's been you know the UAE plan, the United Arab Emirates plan for the day after. It's been, um, you know, this ex-Israeli prime minister's plan for the day after. It's this particular think tank's plan for the day after. Um, that has prompted Palestinians to, or at least some segment of Palestinian scholars and and, and lawyers and, and, you know, experts to, to try to push back against the complete lack of Palestinian input on these day after plans and, and put together other initiatives. Um, so like Palestinian technical groups and, and uh, you know, some of which I'm a part of. Um, but it's it's still like this uphill battle to like have any of that analysis engaged with. Um, and, and it really, it's, it's not like an accident that it's not being engaged with. It's kind of a, a you know, a, a symptom of, of the system's, you know, structure. Um, but more generally, not, not just the last last year, um, the like who speaks on not just like media, like not just war reporting, but who speaks on the entire conflict. Um, I've also noticed both in academia and in policymaking spaces, Palestinian public opinion is not at all engaged with. It's not at all uh, uh, taken as a serious data point uh, uh, as a part of the discussion. Um, I think, you know, personally, I mean, I work with uh, public opinion polling and things like this. I personally think that like you can't make sustainable policy without addressing what people want and making policy based on what is legitimate to, you know, the vast majority of the population. But everything about not just the last year, but everything about American foreign policy and American academia um, has basically discounted that whole notion and assumed that you can make policy and you 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 can make plans, whether it's about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or what happens in this war or whatever, um, by focusing only on particular co-opted elites and that the legitimacy of those plans is, is tangential and won't derail those plans. 
and that the people that you know are going to be the recipients of these plans and the recipients of these policies um, can be crushed or can be acquiesced in some other way. Um, and I think that's just I, I, I don't think that's specific to Palestine. I think that that has been a um, a an, an ongoing concern and and an ongoing issue for people who think about Arab publics generally, how, you know, American foreign policymakers do not seem to think that um, Arab publics matter. And um, in terms of, you know, Arab public opinion and anger about this or that, well, it's a framing issue. We just have to convince them or we just have to, or we just we can just ignore them because these are democratic places anyway. Uh, so they won't have an impact on, you know, on their decision making uh, of their countries, um, which again I think is a really short-sighted uh, uh, way to approach policy, aside from being immoral. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that uh, for the second question. Thank you, Daria. Yeah, thank you, Dana. There's a lot of uh, relatable uh, things, and kind of to pick on that, I think. So who speaks is one part of the problem and that we are not often part of the conversation and you can, have, can break it up in terms of national levels, but even in my work, like thinking I work with environmental consequences is the inclusion you know, of environmentalists on the ground and in conversations about what is happening. Um, it's always a problem, but then the other problem that comes with it is even when uh, people are included in conversation is on, ho on whose terms, right? So who creates those conversations and goes back to the frame and the kind of spaces that we are allocated to speak, which very often significantly limit and determine what is able, um, what we are able to say. And I feel quite often kind of trapped uh, by these structures that um, I didn't develop, but I was kind of assigned to a certain role. And I would say often tokenized and instrumentalized to perform this certain role uh, in terms of speaking up. And there are either for me an option to be an instrument of that, or to kind of rebel and then that function to perform this role of kind of hysterical Ukrainian. <laughs> I think that's another. So it kind of oscillate always between um, even when you are able to speak these different uh, positions. And I'm thinking, you know, Ukraine, I feel like post-2022, Ukraine, at least within the field of the Slavic studies in which I positioned, got a lot of attention. And last year I was um, and you know, preparing for this, I was thinking a lot about that. I was invited to speak on a presidential plenary at AC, the Association for I should know the full name, Association for Slavic East uh, European and Eurasian Studies, which is the biggest conference, uh, obviously the American Association. Uh, <laughs> speaking of knowledge production, um, biggest conference in the field, and it was all um, there was a lot of focus on Ukraine. And uh, being invited to pre this presidential plenary, I was. Of course, obviously, an instrument in this plenary as well, kind of speaking as this Ukrainian voice um, that I really struggled to kind of how to whether I had even a chance to exit it. Um, but I was also thinking at that conference, and this is happening the end of November, beginning of December. So there was a lot of focus on Ukraine. There was very little being talked about Arstakh or Nagorno Karabakh, for example, which is also within the region uh, of the focus of the conference. And there was only one person speaking about Ichkeria or Chechnya, um, Marat Eliasov, whom, whom I met, and um, he was the only scholar from Ichkeria, but also the only really person addressing these questions, um, as he told me. And so thinking also of this kind of hierarchy of knowledge production, even within our field, let's say, and what does it mean then for Ukraine um, to be given that space to speak, right, and to be framed uh, perhaps as a kind of comfortable um, victim or comfortable example of like, decolonizing knowledge, as we are used very often, uh, and what are the conditions, um, therefore, participating in this, and, and, and how, like, how we actually, like, who, who speaks and who says the rules of the game and how we can really engage with them. And, and kind of picking up what Johanna was said as well in that sense that um, I feel like it's always expected from us to also speak emotionally, um, right, as, as, as a kind of in this dual position of uh, being scholars, but also being um, affected or being even, even if a distant witness, still a witness uh, to the ongoing war. Um, and it, it, like one of the things, and I would be interested to hear how you deal with this, because I feel like in the beginning, I was very much resistant to this and kind of tried to fall back in reclaiming my space as a scholar, 
Um, but recently, I really like kind of I, I came to embrace this framing in a strange way, and I'm also questioning what it means for me to embrace it. I guess right, but um, of 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 speaking and and writing in a way that I really want. I kind of reject this notion um, of of distant research, and I really want my writing to move first of all, right, and to move and. Um, to move people to react <laughs> in a certain way. Um, and, and I view it, I kind of view it as a process of reclamation of me speaking, but at the same time, I still question of uh, the space that conditioned this response. Um, and, and what does it mean for me even to reclaim this position? And I'll stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Dana and Daria. Actually, I would like like to mention like a very important aspect uh, that uh, that's like really reflecting the Palestinian case itself. I mean, with all of which is the exile itself. That I mean, I believe that all of the political conflicts like can learn from the Palestinian experience itself about like how mobilizing the public opinion that uh, Syrians and I believe also Ukrainian cases are still like very. I hope it doesn't like last for a long time. I mean, you know, but according to the Syrian, you know, what happened, like it's more like 10 years so far. And then me like living in Germany for more than 10 years and seeing how the exile itself is shaping the knowledge. This is like one of the, one of the like really important experiences to look like at the other diasporas. I mean, how they were able like to shape or like push back over the, the, the public opinion. And in the Syrian example, like, I mean, and also like I witnessed it because like I came to the US like only like three months ago. I mean, before this, I was in Berlin and I can see like how state funded uh, uh, events is like affecting the public opinion, especially for the extreme case of the German state itself, especially like after the 7th of October and even like before the, the Russian war against Ukraine and how all of this fund was distributed in a way uh, uh, to shape and reshape the knowledge itself. For example, like after 2015, with the big wave of receiving Syrians in Germany, we thought, we saw that the fund was totally directed into Syrians, into specific themes, into specific concepts. You know that Syrians were allowed to be participating. But after the coming of Ukrainians to Germany, the Syrian fund was mostly cut to all of the cultural spaces inside, which is you know like good and bad at the same time. But you can see like how all of this fund and the channels that are putting for the field itself in Germany, which can be like applied to many countries, I mean, at the same time is like shaping part of the knowledge. But despite that, all of this fund that was poured for the Syrian uh, 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 representation of the cultural field itself, we can see that still like we have a lot of difficulties about representing what, what happened in Syria in 2011 and what's happening. Um, 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 maybe like referring here, like what uh, uh, Johanna like mentioned about the academic rubbish and also like our positionality, like being seen as people who are emotional and are not able to represent or talk about what happened in those conflicts. I attended like many European conferences and all the time, like when I, you know, like many people who are pro the Syrian revolution and like when a foreign or like, let's say like a white scholar like speaks about Syria as a revolution, it's totally fine. But when me speaking about Syria as a revolution, then the questions would be, why do you consider it as a revolution? Why do you see it as a revolution? How do you frame it this way? So here the point is about like, you know, being an insider or outsider, but also like look, look, being looked as a scholar, as irrational scholar also at the time, at the same time, because you know, you should, when you speak about like a specific country, you should like remove your emotions. And here I believe like the cultural dimension in interpreting, you know, the conflict is like more important than the knowledge that we are, we are, we are being seen. One of the approaches I followed or I'm following all the time about like the academic knowledge I'm doing is trying to bridge uh, uh, what we are producing in academia into Arabic. So I have like a, a, an academic career that is characterized that I produce in English. I produce first of all in Arabic. And then after like, look after the, because I believe like this knowledge that we're producing in the West, uh, uh, what it, I mean, the, the, the first prior, prior or the priority like to be read is by the people who speak the language itself, the people who witness the conflict itself. So the question like that is coming to my mind all the time I mean, all of the books we're writing as academics, if they're not translated into Arabic or, or Ukrainian or Russian, you know, all of those languages that 
uh, consent with those people. What is what is the use of this language itself? Um, yeah, I will just end here and give the space to reflect about, I mean, all of this language exchange and the knowledge production in one language and also not considering like Arabic knowledge that is like the same ex uh, example of Palestine and that is being witnessed now in Syria. Many academic books I'm reading now about Syria not using one Arabic source to talk about Syria. For example, I mean, this is one of the examples. And if Orientalism, I mean, this is like one of the point that Orientalism didn't never mentioned about the language, but to, the only thing that could have been added to Orientalism is about the native languages itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's astonishing that Arab sources are rarely used. Uh, but yeah, uh, Johanna, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I love this is, this is, so striking and I can recognize that like there are academic studies about um, Ukraine or uh, the, the the media coverage of Ukraine that are not using a, a, a single Ukrainian um, work um, and this is this is so I mean it, it's <laughs> not only like unethical um and like wrong in the in the sense of like uh, knowledge decolonization and so on but it's also um yeah lacking in terms of the, the local knowledge that people could could really draw from uh and just yes, to mention the case of media studies um because the russian invasion of ukraine and um then the the occupation of palestine these are situations that are very uh, very heavily med mediatized and so so many um, um, media scholars are jumping on on these topics and they just want to write about them uh, without uh, much pre-existing knowledge um, and this yeah this is where where where, where the idea of, of the academic, uh, academic garbage actually came from uh, because many of the people who write about uh, wars, don't know the context and lack the localized embodied knowledge. Um, but yeah, just just um, again, yeah, speaking about Palestine, it's so uh, the, the 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 lack of Ukrainian voices or or Ukrainian sources is so um, so striking that I am sometimes invited as the Ukrainian voice, although I'm not I'm not a Ukrainian, and I started being interested in Ukraine and learning Ukrainian only a couple of years ago. So that is really um, very strange. Uh, but I think, um, again, something that you all mentioned, uh, how to deal with this, I think we can draw from um, existing streams of research where um, that don't, that don't um, need or that don't require the distance or where the, the distance is not something that is desirable as a position of an academic producing knowledge. Um, just to mention one of these streams, uh, feminist standpoint epistemology that I uh, recently started started working with, uh, where the the positionality of the researcher or the positionality of the academic as um, as a source of of knowledge that is uh, raised, um, classed, gendered, um, and defined by all kinds of identity markers that are that um, result in a type of knowledge that is unavailable to um, people with a different experience. Uh, I think it's just important to um, maybe, yeah, more consciously work with these resources and draw from them. Uh, but I also realize that I'm speaking from the position of someone who is not so heavily um, grounded in in the context where that are experiencing this 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 epistemic injustice. Um, I was born in a country that um, was um, under occupation, but um, I'm still in a yeah quite the privileged position. So I'm also interested in learning from you and he hearing your experiences of how you do it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And now we move to the. Third question, which is a logical continuation of what we have been talking about, and that's about silencing. Who is silent? What forms of censorship cancellation are encountered in coverage of and research on conflicts? 
and how to deal with uh, war propaganda and all this sophistication that is uh, that is reigning in in the countries involved in conflict. Uh, I, I I would like to remark that Elaf unfortunately will have to leave in forty minutes, so we in 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 respect to Elaf let's kind of stick to our five, five minute. Uh, yeah, fine. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, again, Dana. Okay, I'll be as quick as possible, but the, you've just given me so much to think about and talk about. So, um, okay, so what is silenced? I mean, I can I can talk about that, but it obviously bleeds into what we have just been discussing, especially what you what you mentioned uh, enough about like not not only not using scholarship from the place, but then not even translating the scholarship you're making to engagement with the communities that you're studying. I mean, it took a long time, but I just got my book translated into Arabic. English is my strongest academic language. And, and, um, and but I that the process of producing that book first in English and then in Arabic made me reflect on a lot of the gatekeeping in the discipline where it was never um, it was never valued for me to engage with Palestinian scholarship. But I had to write, you know, pages and pages engaging with <laughs> white American IR scholars uh, to prove that I, you know, I was part of this discipline. And so I'm writing a second book now and I'm, you know, very much a different route, uh, a very much a different uh, um, uh, strategy for, for that second book um, where I feel like I'm, I'm not going to be, you know, taking, seriously these end of disciplinary gatekeeping uh, um, uh, gatekeepers and gatekeeping processes. Um, but in terms of what is being silenced, especially in the last year, what kinds of knowledge production is being silenced on this on the on what's happening in Gaza specifically and in Palestine generally, I mean we have seen such a astounding level of attack on um, academics and knowledge producers. Um, in a variety of ways. First, to even use the term genocide, which is corroborated. I'm not a genocide scholar. I'm not an international law scholar, but I have read what other scholars have written about this and other legal experts have written about this. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this is something that resembles, that lives up to that, uh, um, that threshold. And obviously, these are things that are going to be adjudicated, and we shouldn't fixate on just the word. You know, whatever if if the word is genocide or not the, or not genocide, it's still what's happening is is outrageous. But even if you want to use the term genocide, you're attacked and 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 um, you're silenced in in very um, harsh ways in academia. Um, and there's been kind of an attempted silencing of anyone that has knowledge on this issue. So, for example. Um, people have gotten in trouble, and I still, you know, feel concerned about it. Whenever I'm asked to appear on a panel, or sp even even in like the most mainstream establishment places, I have to think about somebody possibly attacking me. If I want to, if I muster the knowledge that I have and muster the expertise that I have to talk about the context of the war in the context of the broader conflict. So talking about anything be before October 7th, you're accused of providing context to minimize what happened on October 7th, um, which obviously like is, is again, not accidental. Like people are doing this because they don't want knowledge about this issue coming out, proliferating in public spaces and media. They want to frame this in a very particular way as if, you know, history began on October 7th and even those who like go to great lengths to say, well, no, it's not that I'm, you know, October 7th or, you know, that violence. I'm not saying that's good. I'm just saying this is, this is what happened. This is, this is the context to understand because these things don't come out of a vacuum, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're, you know, those kinds of, those kinds of discussions are completely foreclosed in a lot of, a lot of different places. Um, and people have been attacked. People have lost their jobs. People, you know, um, is, I mean, the Middle East Studies Association, which encompasses more than political science very broadly. Anybody who studies the Middle East has has a committee on academic freedom that has been working tirelessly in the last year to try to um, first take stock of how much attack has happened and how much people have been repressed and silenced, and also to try to uh, fight for academic freedom 
and then the project on Middle East political science, I believe, uh, was the organization, or at least the professor in charge of that, which is uh, uh, Mark Lynch, um, they put together also a survey of uh, Middle East scholars, and it was like over 90% are reporting self-censorship around this issue. So it's it's just, you know, the silencing is, is very, uh, very strong. In reporting, you know, um, in media, journalists have been killed to such an extent um, that I believe in the in 2023, 75 percent of all journalists killed were killed in Gaza. And in in uh, just two days ago, the report by the um, committee, um, uh, the committee to protect journalists, they found that uh, 137 journalists and media workers um, have been killed in the last year. So it's uh, yeah, the silencing is is happening in a variety of ways, all to serve the purpose of obfuscating what is actually happening in Palestine um, to uh, make sure that those who are perpetrating these crimes are never, um, you know, held to account. It's it's as simple as that. Um, yeah, so I'll pass it on. Thank you. Daria? Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, just listening to that and, and also... I reflected on, on colleagues around who are also dealing with similar situations. Um, I'll go back uh, perhaps to what Ella was saying and also Dana was saying in terms of languages and um, you know visibility of work done in other languages than in English. Um, absolutely true in the case with Ukraine, though are also sometimes even less optimistic when things are available in English. So the, the, the economies of knowledge are structured in a way that even when you have, I think, things available in English, they're still not references, referenced and quoted. And in particular, in my work on the environment, for example, there is a fantastic resource, Ukraine uh, War Environmental Consequences War Group, that features um, writings by environmentalists on the ground, mostly in Ukraine, um, by environmental scholars who provide um, fantastic analysis in very accessible language for non-experts of what happens in Ukraine. And I almost never see it quoted in any Western media, you know. So like resources are there quite often and they're made accessible, you know, people uh, in Ukraine are thinking about how, the, uh, how to communicate. And it's not, it's it's different, of course, it's not like violently silenced, but it just simply somehow doesn't get into those um, economies of knowledge or like circulation, dissemination of knowledge, uh, which makes me think, um, and, and part of, you know, what Spilna is doing, why we here is kind of creating this perhaps kind of alternative streams of, uh, of knowledge circulation and, um, and yeah, referencing each other's work relating um, to each other's work. The one thing that I encountered, uh, particularly in my work on the environment, um, is not so much silent, silencing is once again, it's kind of fitting into this, uh, frames that are predetermined and like what is lost uh, beyond these frames and particularly in, in, in with respects and with the environment I'm struggling between always kind of uh, figuring out um, this idea of kind of uh, total destruction and devastation which is of course there and I don't want to diminish it I mean it, it, it is absolutely happening um, but this notion um, that and it I'll revoke um, a work by Katrina M. Powell, who worked on narratives uh, about representation of refugees, in the sense that when you, the way, so she writes that the way you represent refugees, uh, it's it's done through certain distance that the person who is looking is supposed to as assume that we are not looking at somebody like us, right? So this experience of refugees is only relevant to this person the way they're portrayed. But in a way, um, this experience of, of return to the question of the gaze um, uh, establishes this distance. And I feel like with narratives of devastation and destruction and atrocities, there is also certain this kind of certain created perhaps distance um, for a lot of viewers that allow us to say, okay, th this is like all this destruction is happening, but it's not happening here. And, and so it's different, right? So this is specific to this uh, context. So there's a there's a narrative of this ultimate devastation and then with regards to the environment for example there's this narrative of kind of miraculous recovery that is especially prominent now with kahovka but you could see in ukraine even pr prior with chernobyl narratives for example but with kahovka right follow this extreme devastation um the proliferation proliferation of narratives so it's like look it has becoming overgrown and green and wonderful um 
and it kind of, and we also have seen it as familiar narrative for us, even through COVID in the way we saw environmentally people writing about dolphins in the Venice canals and this idea that like, no matter how much we destroy things, they will kind of miraculously recover um, and go back. And I feel like, for example, like media always kind of is between and, and scholarship between these two poles and, and narratives, which doesn't really reflect on what happens on the ground and I always struggle to kind of uh, <laughs> you know um, fit in and address those things and for example last year I was writing for BBC and they they, they approached me to ask me to write a, a question on Ukraine's green awakening and through this very positive frame of how Ukraine is pioneering all the ecocide uh, policies and and you know going all green because of the war and it, it felt like a completely absurd a frame also knowing um, the level of um, you know destruction that is also done at the hands of business lobby in Ukraine, not even by Russia at the moment because of the war in which the war is kind of used, um, you know, to cover what what is happening with the business lobby. So it's it's always it's so things are silenced, but not necessarily directly and violently, um, but just by through existence of this frames perhaps and, and and my challenge here is to kind of address them I think in a more nuanced and complex ways which uh which is uh yeah which is not sometimes what the audience wants I guess and I'll just stop here thank you hey love well actually what is silenced actually it's very difficult like to say what is silence but I mean I don't like to generalize in general but I mean according to statistics also if we take like translation as like one part of the knowledge production what is translated this is this has been like you know the the the, the statistics like for years the same thing like what is translated like from Arabic into English equals to less one percent for all of the uh, a market of translation in the world. So if we like would think about it like in, indirectly that what is silenced from the Arab knowledge into English, we can say 99% of all of the things. But to be also like reading those numbers also like correctly, I'm talking about only literature in this case, by the way, I'm not talking about the knowledge. So uh, uh, in my in my recently published book, I tried because you know we don't have any statistics about the knowledge uh, translation from Arabic into English. But uh, into my recently published book, I tried like to collect books, uh, uh, the translations that were translated uh, uh, from Arabic into English from uh, 2010 to 2017, if I remember well, where I collected more than 600. Uh, 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 books translated from Arabic into English and excluding all of the literature books doesn't mean here literature doesn't like produce knowledge or like, you know, but all of those, you know, all of this amount of, of translation are like equaling like 1% of the, of the translation market for the language of Arabic itself. I was able like to find not more than tens of books that are not literature translated from Arabic into English. I mean, this is like how it is. But then going for the titles themselves, it was very surprising that all of the books that were translated, they were classics. Like it, they were about Ibn Khaldun, about Al Ghazali, about the Nahda period in the Arab world, but nothing related, mostly nothing. I wouldn't say like nothing because I know like a lot of Syrian authors who were translated into English and, uh, you know, and who are like considered to be like Syrian intellectuals. But also like we have a lot of Palestinian Lebanese intellectuals who were translated into English also at the same time. But all of the knowledge production that is seen that deserves to be translated or worthy to be translated is only the classics of Arabic. This is like what I what I was able to see. And also like if we go for all of the initiatives of translation in USA and in Europe, we can see that there are big campaigns for translating the classics only by the big universities of the US and also Europe at the same time. So maybe this like gives us like a context about what is silenced in general. Uh, 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 like, you know, generally, uh, and when we go for the Syria, this is like what, what I start the context itself, I mean, of my book. And then we go to the Syria and the translation of the language of the Syrian revolution. We find like there is, there are only three books translated those, the, the language of the, re the revolution, the graffiti, the slogans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also like building or basing my opinion or my my conclusion on on theories i mean if we like see what uh, giselle sapiro for example like mentions about the knowledge production 
we can see that this is like a, a main characteristic all the time of the center that uh, uh, it imports, uh, uh, sorry, it exports uh, uh, more than it imports about the knowledge. So like maybe like to explain the sentence, like all the time the production of the knowledge about the periphery itself is more than what is taken from the periphery to the center itself. I stop here. Thank you, Johanna. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, get back to what Dana was saying about um, the Genoans being killed, because I think this is incredibly uh, worrying and important to stress that, um, yeah, there are dozens of journalists um, being killed um, every year. Uh, and now the, the, the case of Palestine is, is just horrifying. Um, and what we see is that the journalists who face this these forms of violence are disproportionately local journalists. So when there is a foreign reporter who um, gets killed on the ground, it is uh, everywhere in the media and um, the local journalists and local producers and fixers are not sometimes even mentioned by um, or, or covered um, as widely as the, as the foreign reporters. Um, and this is, uh, this, I think, points to a growing impunity of violence towards journalists, which I think is something that we should really be worried about. Um, because I think armies are increasingly treating journalists as legitimate targets. What, what we can know, how we can know, and things that we can know about wars uh, from people who are on the ground. Um, so this is something just uh, that we should really uh, think about, I think, uh, and that the international community and international media uh, organizations should think about and should um, fight. Um, but otherwise, I think what is silenced uh, when you look at media, uh, at the media, and it also um, resonates with what some of you have been saying. Um, I think when you look at the media, what is silence are things that are too complicated. So history, and this is um, the case, I think, of all the context that we are talking about today. Um, so yeah, for example, the history before the, the 7th of October or um, the history of Ukraine is very um, invisible in, um, um, yeah, in the coverage and the frame academia. Uh, I think that's uh, that's the opposite. What is silence are things that are too clear, too morally clear, uh, like the word genocide. Um, um, and maybe I would like to also get back to what you were saying at the beginning, Volodya, because um, I I think that this notion of the fog of war also implies, and a lot of academics are th I, I think are thinking about the war. In this way as about a context that is impossible to know and where knowledge and fact just disappear and you 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 can't know but i think we should really um um fight this notion that things are unknowable because then it leads to judgmental relativism and it leads to um yeah nihilism basically moral nihilism so um yeah, I think we're also our responsibility is to, um, yeah, maybe yeah, say that things are complicated, but also that we can know what what is going on on the ground, and that there are facts that we can point to, and that the international community should pay attention to. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yes, indeed, it's. Uh... It's a paradoxical situation when we have uh, wars streamed online, we have these uh, communities of uh, online intelligence and, and we have lots of journalists traveling everywhere and so on. And yet uh, we still find ourselves in, in a situation of uh, uncertainty and unclearness, obfuscation and, and, and so on. And I would like to add uh, here that uh, self-censorship is something that I hear a lot from my colleagues who study Ukraine or are from Ukraine. Uh, it's obviously not comparable to what uh, Palestinian uh, or, or uh, Arab uh, authors 
face now, uh, but it's, it still exists. Uh, and uh, it's uh, specifically because what uh, Daria mentioned, the structure, uh, the st structure of the conflict as it's represented as the, so there is suffering slot and there is only specific suffering that matters and, and there is only one aggressor and, and, and this is like binary, uh, binary distinction where everyone should fit. And then uh, the other experiences, including bodily experiences are somehow lost there. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a very, that's a very relevant topic. And, uh, but uh, we need to uh, move further. And the last question is on how to cooperate. And it's obviously linked, whether it's possible to cooperate and what are the limitations of cooperation in knowledge production with the authorities uh, that lead the armies, with the civil societies on the ground, with combatants and with the victims of the conflicts. Uh, and here, I, I'm sorry, I, I would really like to prioritize Elaf this time because he, he, he will have to leave soon. So I, I give the word to Elaf. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry for leaving, but I counted like for 90 minutes. Uh, um... Maybe like, just like, I mean, like wrapping all of what we mentioned, like coming from different conflicts and 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 also like talking about different audiences. Uh, and if we like here trying to give like, uh, uh, um, like more importance, like for the idea I mentioned about exile and uh, each conflict like is being having like a specific attention for a specific period of time. I would like think about like, how we can cooperate, how we can like, you know, maybe like the key is like to have solidarity. Uh, 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 and this is what I was able like to see in Berlin, for example, like a uh, few months ago, especially like when the German fund like was directed to the Ukrainian activists, uh, you know, after the, the, the Ukrainian, uh, the Russian war against Ukraine. Like where I saw like uh, many Ukrainian academics, many Ukrainian activists, like who were in solidarity for what happened in Syria. And this really meant a lot, you know, for, for Syrians, like who were like suddenly like they had no lights, uh, uh, you know, or like very few or few lights uh, of what, what, what was happening. So uh, uh, all the time, like I was invited or I was like, you know, participating in many events that were like related particularly about what happened in Ukraine or what's happening in Ukraine. For me as a Syrian who, you know, like talking about like the politics of, of the country and the representation of culture and art in this, which is like, I find it like a very important key about how we can, you know, do and learning with the Palestinian diaspora again, you know, I mean, this is like what I see it like here, the very matured experience about mobilizing and being able, I mean, what happened, what's happening now after this event of October, I mean, it needs like, it, it, it invites all of the nations, I think, all of the, all of the people through different languages to learn about the Palestinian experience in activism uh, uh, in Europe and in the West about how you're able to mobilize in the streets and how you are able like to, to speak up you know, in solidarity of what's happening in Syria and Ukraine at the same time. Thank you, Tana. Yeah, thank you, Aylaf. Um So in terms of how to cooperate, again, because I straddle a couple of different spaces, I think some spaces can be useful to try to engage with and to try to push the boundaries of the discussion and some and some spaces not. And it really is uh, context dependent. Um, generally speaking, because I'm a Palestinian in the diaspora, I was born in Jerusalem uh, and, and lived there for some time, but I am now, you know, firmly in the diaspora in the United States. Um, and there's lots of Palestinians like me in the global north or in, you know, like the largest Palestinian community outside of the Middle East is in Chile, for example. These are Palestinians in the diaspora with, with, uh, Privileges, you know, they are privileged. They have the space, especially at a time when Palestinians in historic Palestine are just being, excuse me, that was my cat. Uh, Palestinians in the death are being so crushed. Um, given that we have these privileges and we do have some levels of access, all of all of the ways that we discussed today, that there's silencing and things like that, but there's still access. There's still levers of power that we can engage with. Um, I think that it is an application of responsibility to completely ignore that to say, you know, we're not going to engage in policy, we're not going to engage in academic knowledge production. I, I know it's an uphill battle in any of these spaces, but 
we do have the privileges to do that in a way that some of our countrymen don't. And so my personal position on this is that I try to engage in places that I, I feel there might be some degree of utility, you know, given that I'm only an academic, given that all I do is write <laughs> um, and, and um, that's what I can do. Under the Biden administration, so now it has become increasingly clear. In retrospect, it's become increasingly clear. But the top was useless and intransigent. intransigent. Policy was being blocked at the top. It was being blocked by Biden himself. It was being blocked by McGurk and Anthony Blinken at the State Department. It's 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 the top was rotten. So it didn't matter how much people were trying to push different parts of the State Department and how much people in the different arms of the U.S. government were actually changing their opinions and 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 absorbing some of the information that was being given to them it wasn't it wasn't rising to the top it was being blocked at the top and that's be become clear but i think that even during that time engagement with the state department for example and 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 i would you know sometimes be asked to give presentations at the at the state department or the foreign service institute that did have some impact we had resignations at the state department you know um and and i don't think that we can just completely discount that kind of engagement of course within certain parameters and I'll, and I'll describe what I mean in a second. In the media, again, if I'm allowed, I've, I've been engaging. I think that we can cooperate and engage if I'm allowed to challenge the framing. And if I'm not allowed to challenge the framework, if I'm being censored, I don't engage in those kinds of spaces. Um, obviously the diaspora, as I said, it has all of everything I'm talking about has to be within particular parameters. The diaspora has to be careful to be entrenched in the material reality or understanding the material reality of what's happening back home in the conflict zone and what people there want. And as long as you're making a good faith effort not to speak on behalf of Palestinians from the diaspora, but to amplify what Palestinians in historic Palestine are are saying, the, the discussions that are happening there, the, and not to presume kind of an, a hierarchy of importance that like I'm the enlightened one, then I can speak on behalf of, of the, this group back home then you can cooperate in ways that I think feel productive. In academia, there's also obviously lots of gatekeeping. Um, there was a really interesting uh, essay posted uh, on um, in the Institute for Palestine Studies called Digging Tunnels with Pens, Anonymous Publishing as Intellectual Resistance. So Palestinians are discussing a variety of ways to get around gatekeeping, one of which can be anonymous publishing. Um, and it, it harkens back to previous uh, um, time periods in the Palestinian struggle during the Palestinian uprisings when people had to be anonymous and to, to write and things like that. That's one way. Um, but in academia, you can also find the groups and spaces in which you can publish and, and, and you can generate knowledge that doesn't feel overly constrained, that doesn't feel um, so twisted as to become useless and ineffective. And uh, I know I've, you know, said a lot about the poli sci discipline, and I'm sure the social sciences more generally, but there are those spaces. And that's what, you know, now that I'm kind of mid-career, like th those are the spaces that I find myself engaging with um, and, and I found um, access to. Um, of course, everything I'm saying now with the Trump administration, come, you know, incoming, like some spaces now are no longer useful to cooperate with and engage with. Like government is no longer useful to cooperate with and engage with. Um, there are adjacent, like adjacent to the US government, like establishment think tanks and things like that. Um, what's interesting in the last years that I have found that like, at least internally, the discussions around Israel-Palestine in those places are actually shifting. And I was invited into spaces I, I never would have been invited into before, kind of establishment play, uh, spaces. So like the Council on Foreign Relations and things like this. Um, but, you know, there's a Trump administration coming. So I don't know how how much cooperation with those spaces is is going to be useful in, um, in, in the medium term. Um, I've just been focusing or I've been trying to engage with those who are focused on building alternative spaces, alternative media spaces in particular, um, that can then you know, make enough of an impact that the establishment then the establishment's places take them seriously. So one final example before I, I let my co-panelists speak is that um, I engage a lot with uh, this magazine called Jewish Currents. Um, and it's it's considered, I think, pretty alternative. You know, it's not it's not at all kind of mainstream establishment, not within the American Jewish community, not within the American public generally. But the Jewish Currents engagement has led me to to, you know, get invitations from The New York Times. So I think we, sh we shouldn't discount 
like strengthening those alternative spaces um, definitely might have an impact uh, um, broader than we expect. Um, and it's not a waste of effort to to engage in in alternative media spaces um, um, and lend credibility to those alternative media spaces, especially because everybody on this panel, you know, we have like a certain academic credibility that we can lend to those spaces. So I will just leave it at that. And and thank you so much for this panel. This has been such a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Donna. Daria. Thank you. Thank you. And I also wanted to actually uh, say thank you to Dana for all your work that you do speaking up and also kind of building bridges and conversations between Ukraine and Palestine. I must say that in the past years, I learned tremendously from you and I'm thank grateful. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's hard. Those conversations are not common, right? And it's, it's hard to establish them. Um, and... Uh, um, yeah, and, and in many ways, you know, like I also want to say that Spielner has been doing an incredible job and with this conference and with the publications, it's been a traumatic, an incredibly important space for me to learn from and uh, and to also even, yeah, just to listen. I feel like we, we, we speak a lot about speaking out, but it's also listening. That's another skill that we have to practice is actually um, um, kind of attentively listen to other contexts and, and, and um, not... not jumping into them with assumptions it's been difficult for me as well um uh, to do that and my approach has also been trying to engage in conversations when, where i can even with places in which i feel sometimes uncomfortable or a certain level of hostility um but i look at it there's like i mean i i come from a place of privilege you know i live in safety i have access to water and electricity and everything and i have a job at the moment and so I take it as a, as a kind of labor to um, actually where I can uh, bridge the conversations with groups uh, and, and, and build actively. Um, because I see the one thing with Ukraine that I see, and I'm not speaking here about those people on the ground, right? It's, I think there are different um, resources available to us, including emotional resources sometimes to engage this conversation. But um, I'm thinking of public intellectuals, scholars, um, based in the West and the kind of work that we can do or the, the people in the diaspora. And I think sometimes with Ukraine, there is a danger of kind of closing in on our own context, which is, of course, um, the question of a lot of societies that go through, that, that live through violence and live through traumatic experiences. Um, and and or, so either focus on ourselves, or only talk in this frame of European democratic values, uh, which is, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, as exclusive and, and, and racialized and, and violent frame in itself. And I think it's very important that we actually listen to other contexts and kind of actively engage with in, 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 in conversation. That's something I'm, for example, having arrived to Chicago, trying to do is uh, reach out to community centers, trying to figure out how to do um, events and conversations um, that are open. And actually, I think that there is really important to meet people face to face or even on online. I think we do really little for reasons because of an, the way uh, conversations are framed and structured and resources and kind of knowledge economy. But there is very little opportunities I find sometimes to actually like talk to people and, and and listen to what they say. And, and I think there's tremendous value in that because otherwise we end up in this eco chamber. So only kind of circling in, in, in the same in the same groups um, that, that um, is, is difficult to break for me. And in that respect, you know, Spilne has been an important place. There's Ukrainian Feminist Film Festival. They don't call themselves Ukrainian Feminist Film Festival. It's a Feminist Film Festival, Filma, which is going to, um, starts on the 23rd of November until 8th of December, we're going to have everything's online and there will be 15 films, two of them from Ukraine and the rest are from Lebanon, from Sudan, from New Zealand. So they're also actively building and kind of um, creating conversations and I would uh, encourage people to support, but also places like South South, the Phenambulist, um, I think creating, and, and I know that it takes so much effort and work and labor to actually establish these conversations um, and I just want to say that I'm grateful and I hope we can continue building the spaces. Thank you, Johanna. Yeah, thanks a lot. I, I don't think there is much to add, but um, I, I think this is a great space and I think there should be um, a lot more of that, um, this exchange between um, yeah, people with the knowledge on and from Syria, Palestine and Ukraine. Um, so thanks a lot for that. Um,
uh, it's quite rare, but it's uh, it's really valuable. Um, and I think we should um, also focus on the, the shared values and extend uh, our calls to other contexts that are struggling for the same values. Um, so and there are there are lots of values that I think we share and that um, are under attack in the cases that we study or that we know. Um, so yeah, the word solidarity is just um, what I think we should really focus on. Uh, and I wanted to uh, say another uh, media related thing. Um, I think we should interact beyond social media spaces um, because um, social media is um, an increasingly um, toxic place that also as research <laughs> Uh, has um, confirmed or, or is constantly proving privileges, anger, and fear. And uh, I think to engage in a meaningful conversation, it's, um, yeah, these emotions are not always uh, the most productive. Uh, so, yeah, going beyond social media and going um, elsewhere than only on social media and engaging in, in a conversation in real life or in other spaces such as this one, um, is really valuable. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to, wanted to say is um, that I think we should really take care of ourselves uh, because, um, yeah, burning out uh, when you're so engaged and when you're so invested in, um, yeah, doing research that will make a change uh, in the long term can be really... Um, yeah, detrimental to your your mental well being and mental health. So, um, it's also important, I think, to to take care of ourselves and yourself. Thank you very much, Johanna, and thank you. Uh, thanks to all the speakers. It was a, a really exciting and dynamic conversation. And now, I uh, invite uh, people to ask questions Q and A. And at the bottom, at the bottom of this Zoom uh, Zoom application, so far I see only one question which has already been answered. Sorry, and I just took the liberty. yeah, yeah. No, that's that's totally fine. That's totally fine. And while you are uh, thinking about your questions, I would like to ask myself. I have a lot of questions, obviously. I would like to ask Dana. Uh, uh, and um, I would like to, to address this the issue of knowledge production elsewhere in the in the Arab world, for example, to places like Al Jazeera and, and, and other outlets. Uh, what, what's happening there? Uh, what's uh, how influential? First of all, how influential are this 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 outlet? And secondly, all the issues that we talked about here, like censorship and certain framing and so on, how does this figure there? Yeah. Um... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So nice seeing you. I'm obliged to leave. Okay. Yeah, we are sorry, we are sorry, we are sorry to lose you, but I uh, uh, hope you have a nice day. So just very um, briefly. So um, Al Jazeera um, obviously has, in terms of being the only uh, international media that is like present in Gaza, like um, obviously, it it plays a large role, it, and has historic, you know, since the Arab Spring has played like an outsized role in um, generating, at least like journalistic media knowledge about um, what's happening in these different places in a way that is, you know, leaps and bounds above a lot of the Western uh, um, uh, media outlets. Um, and, and they employ different journalists and things like that in a way that is much more embedded in local contexts. At the and you know we have a couple of different <coughs> outlets, including Al Arab. Excuse me, I'm getting, I'm sick. Al Arab uh, the New Arab, also uh, uh, um, Qatar based. Um, but the reality is that like the the media landscape, and this is not my area of expertise. This is just based on my perception. But the media landscape in the Arab world is um, is not a free one. And these these outlets are, uh, you know, affiliated and supported by particular governments or others. So you're getting different um, lenses and different framings depending on what you're what you're watching. So if you're watching Al Arabiya that comes out of Saudi Arabia, that's going to be very different. Um, if you're watching Al Jazeera that comes out of Qatar, though, again, I think Al Jazeera does the best job of being locally mm -hmm. embedded, mm -hmm. um, and the New Arab also, but also that is Qatar based, Qatar affiliated. Um, that being said. Um, 
the issue of Palestine in particular has, I mean, I've written about this in the past. Palestine is a gateway issue in the Arab world to broader opposition and dissent. Uh, pa- you know, Arab publics don't see Palestine as something separate, something, some, some niche issue. It's an, it's part and parcel of um, their grievances around authoritarianism generally. Palestine is just like kind of one symptom of this broader authoritarianism, um, and the, you know, the the authoritarian consolidation that has occurred in the region, um, especially in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Um, and especially after the Abraham Accords, uh, the Arab-Israeli peace deals that occurred under Trump and and the, the policy that flows out of the Abraham Accords uh, to the present day, um, Israel has been more uh, um, directly embedded in this kind of authoritarian uh, consolidation of the region. So um, given that that's the case, the question of Palestine, which used to be one of the few few political issues that you can speak about, you can write about, you can generate knowledge about um, more freely than other issue areas, um, that is no longer the case in the Arab world. So there are uh, particular area, you know, particular countries, particular cases in the Arab world where that has become also a red line. And that speaks to mm-hmm. the fact that Palestine is, you know, the, the, these authoritarian regimes recognize that Palestine is a gateway issue to further dissent. And it, it, it is an obstacle people's grievances around Palestine are an obstacle to the authoritarian consolidation that they want to they want to see unfold um, in the region in terms of both authoritarian regimes working with each other to crush dissent, um, but authoritarian regimes working with Israel to crush dissent. Um, so um, yeah, so the 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 long story short is that Palestine is being censored in different parts of the Arab world. Not across the board. So there are places, there are spaces where Palestine is still a discussion. Um, so Qatar is one of those places. But places where we used to historically see more discussion, it has much, it has become much more uh, repressed. So in Egypt, for example, uh, protesters that were pro-Palestine were I- imprisoned. Um, the space for the discussion of Palestine is much more circum, you know, circumscribed. In Saudi Arabia, that's, you know, completely off the table. Um, you know, so it, it has shifted, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Uh, I don't actually see any questions. Uh, and uh, I would uh, I, I would like to know whether there is anything on Facebook. Let me let me check. Daria, uh, uh, Daria, uh, Daria no, no, do we have anything on Facebook? Let me see. No, no questions there. Okay, well, I will not leave you alone, but uh, yeah, officially we are over time. So if uh, some of you would like to leave, uh, you have the full right to do so. Um, yeah, I apologize. I, I do have to leave uh, uh, to get to my next obligation, but I just want to say once again that um, I'm, I really appreciate being invited and I um I'm very uh, grateful for Spilne's uh, ongoing work. Thank you. Thank you. We are honored to have you here. Yeah. Have a nice All day. Right. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Uh, all right. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't really see any questions so far, and we are over time. So I think uh, we are going to thank each other again. And I personally thank you for for coming here and for uh, engaging in this lively and and uh, illuminating conversation. And uh, yeah, we can. Uh, that's uh, that's a reminder to our participants. Uh, you can uh, see this on Facebook, uh, streamed and recorded. So whoever missed any important parts will be able to release it and uh, on this note thank you to everyone thank you to the organizers of this conference and have a nice day or night thank you thanks a lot again